we don't really care about what any other bands are doing. There's a lot of great music around, but we just want to sound like us. Hey everyone, welcome to the channel. My name is Belgian Jasper. If this is your first time in the channel, hit subscribe right now. Okay, Tim, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Um, the countdown is finally on. Uh, in March, we'll finally see the album come out, an album that you've been working on for almost three years. Um, are you already getting quite hyped or are you like in a state of I'll believe it when I see it when this album actually comes out like because this has been a bit of an ordeal getting this album uh, made uh, what what's the sentiment right now for you yeah definitely pretty hyped right now I can, <laughs> that whole I'll see I'll believe it when I see it I think that was um, that was every day until it was mastered right but then even then, you know, there's all these worldwide delays happening with printing vinyl. And when we first talked to Season of Mist, um, we, you know, we sent it to them in in July, like second week of July or something like that. First, first mm -hmm. second week of July, um, 2022. And we got told, oh, yeah, it'll be out um, the f f fall next year. And that's like f 15 months later. Yeah. And we we're all like, <laughs> what? <laughs> we've spent like years trying to finish this what, what what do you mean we have to wait like 15 more months anyway so thankfully they managed to kind of rearrange a few things to push it forward about six more months to, to march which is still like a decent yeah, length yeah. of time to wait when the album was done in in july like normally when working with season to miss it would be about maybe four months from when we give them the album to when the album comes out like roughly right. um but I think the thing that really made it real was just releasing the first single, Equas, um, which you know came out first week of December, because then it was like, we're not telling people you're going to hear something soon or trust us, it's done. Right, right. It's like here is a song, watch it, listen to it, and you know believe it. And then everyone else obviously then started to hey, they really are. Now with Scars really are coming out with a new record. Um, yeah. And a lot of people were really enjoying the song. So I think since the single came out, it's been a bit of a different vibe. And um, yeah, definitely just one of excitement. And, you know, since then, in that same time frame, you know, we announced headline tours through the Europe, UK, through the US and Canada. We've got more stuff in the works as well. And I guess that makes it more real as well. Because then you're saying, hey, here's a new album. Here's some tours. We're not just saying sometime eventually anymore. We're in the action yeah, yeah, stage. Yeah. Yeah, of yeah. um of these uh these uh long processes there are albums coming out today that were finished two years ago you guys finished it a few months ago but it took you a long time to to establish it but it gave you the opportunity to kind of go go back a little bit um and, uh, and and make tweaks, Le leave the bun in the oven a little bit longer. And, and you mentioned that that was one of the things that, that you kind of liked as well. Are there now, just briefly before we look ahead, are there, um, if you look back at the previous albums, are there songs or albums where you're like, you know what, given if I had the time, if I had the means, there are, there are some that I would like to, you know, give that extra treatment to as well? Um... Uh, yes and no so the when it comes to the songwriting with with all of the records um you know we only ever finish songs if if we love it if we think it's amazing um you know if you don't if you're not passionate about the stuff that you're writing then probably no one else is going to be <laughs> either and so with every album that we've ever done um when at the time we finished writing those songs, we're like, oh, wow, this is like some of the best stuff we've ever done. Mm -hmm. And we, if we don't have that feeling, often we just don't finish the song, you know? It's a lot of work to write a 12 minute song or whatever. I mean, if you're not, con if you're not sold on it, normally it right. kind of fades, fades out and it never gets finished. So from a songwriting perspective, with every album, we've been incredibly proud of what we've done and just felt like we've just been able to build and continue to explore the way that we write music 
um, and that's been really wonderful. So I wouldn't really go back necessarily and change any of the writing or uh, or performances really with anything. I mean, some things like we're a bit better now. Like I feel like I'm a much better singer than I was on Portal of Eye, for example, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so I I prefer hearing live versions because <laughs> you know I, I listen to Portal of Eye and I go ah oh, I don't love my vocals on it, but that's just because I know that you know it was more than a decade ago that I recorded them and I'm a better singer now. Yeah, yeah, but the thing yeah. that I do pick up is production. You know, um, with every album, we continue to experiment with production. So the way that we've recorded, the way we've mixed and mastered it, and every album has been different. And Exil, I feel like by far is the closest to um, how we want the band to sound. You know, Earn was a step in that direction where. You know, um, we worked with Jens Bogren, who's an incredible producer um, mm -hmm. on the first two records, and Citadel sounded fantastic. Um, it was like a step up from Portal of I. It was very clean, clear, not super heavy. And then people would come to see the live show and we would get a lot of comments about, they were surprised at how heavy we sounded live. Right. And I'm like, yeah, well, the songs are heavy. And so we had this vibe of that we wanted the albums to be more like the live show and how we sound in real life. And that was, I guess, behind the change to work with Mark Lewis, um, with Earn. And then that was a step in that right direction of it having a bit of a heavier production, but the limitations were that he was only involved in the end, the mixing right. and mastering. So this time we had him involved with the entire process. So he was supposed to fly to Australia to record the whole thing with us. The borders got shut down, that didn't right. happen. But he was still involved uh, remotely in every decision, you know, choosing the mics, hearing the takes, um, no matter what studio we were recording at. And we used nine different recording, recording studios in four different countries around the world. Um, he was involved in all of that. And then that meant that when we got to the mixing process, everything just fit together a lot better. And then yeah. him and I worked very closely on that to, you know, create um, the product um, that we, we ended up with. Um, there's also a bit of a premiere for the band with this record because if we consider uh, Anedonia a song that has vocals on it, I think this is the first time that you guys ever released a song with vocals that is under four minutes long. Uh, it, 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 where, 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 at the end of that, was that were people in the band going like, oh, wasn't that just the intro? Like, come on, let's get started. Or was that like, oh, that's refreshing. We can actually write a song under four minutes yeah well <laughs> it's funny because that, that was something I, I wrote that whole one um, myself and it was written about a year later after every, everything else so yeah um, you know everything else was written before March 2020 there were some parts that weren't written some of the vocals or violin were written later but and had only as a track got written in early 2021 yeah um, and um, it, it was I guess really that thing of when I was trying to think about the track list and how to round it off um, and thinking about, okay, well, we did kind of an intro outro track on something like Citadel or, or whatever. Right. How to approach that idea from a different perspective. And you're right. Like normally when we go to that short track, it's an instrumental. Yeah. Um, whereas with this one, it was, you know, me sitting there playing the piano singing. That was the original idea behind okay. that track. Um, and I guess some of those ideas don't end up coming across to be then used in Naval of Scarus music. And so I guess that's always the thing with every record. We're always trying to push our boundaries with what we're writing artistically. And then funnily enough, in this scenario, it's going, oh, let's just take one really nice idea and then that's it. <laughs> Instead of, you know, Getting um, awesome, going yeah. off into the, you know, 12, 20 minutes and sort of thing. And, and it was definitely written I guess as um, a continuation of the track growl of going, right. me listening to the end of that and going, okay, like how do I then uh, um, help bring this album to a close um, in, uh, you know, after such a, a big epic ending that yeah. you know, is featured in that track. It's it's interesting where, you know, uh, in its broadest description, progressive metal sometimes becomes, um, almost like a prisoner of its own you know expected creativity where it's like 
uh, it's almost like, wow, how dare this prog metal band write a song that it's not 25 minutes long with 10,000 different changes. Is that something that um, today with your experience that you have now, are you allowing yourself to be a little bit more whimsical is maybe not the right word, but a little bit more free of expectation? Um, I think that whenever we've written, we've always tried really hard to not think about anything else except for the song when we're writing okay. and just ignore the existence of the record label and fans and the wider world and, and just write for, for us, trusting that when we love something in the past, it's it's gone pretty well. And that was the thing with Portal of Eye. You know, we wrote that in our bedrooms in our little, you know, rehearsal studio in Melbourne, Australia, with no one really knowing the band existed. And right. and we were excited about the songs. And so Citadel was the first one where it was like, oh, people are now waiting for this. Not not a lot of people, but some. <laughs> and then obviously with each record, more people are waiting. With this one, obviously there's a lot of expectation because you know, it's like five and a half years. By the time this record comes out, it'll be five and a half years since Earn. And there's a lot of people that then have expectations for it to fill that void of what they've been waiting for. But to be honest, I think um, I haven't been worried in the slightest. Like, you know, it's just I guess the way I connect with the music that we write. You know, before the release of Equas, I'm like, yeah, this is going to be one of our most popular songs mm -hmm. no doubt so the, the video is great we put it out a lot of people will will say that it's great some people won't that's that's fine um and just having that confidence that no 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 like this is this is you know a really great representation of what we're good at yeah, yeah. and that's all you can do and it's being comfortable with that and not trying to be anything else you know we're we don't really care about what any other bands are doing. There's a lot of great music around, but we just want to sound like us. And yeah, yeah, yeah. what that sounds like is able to be whatever we we choose, you know, and every album's a little bit different. Um, every album's a little bit the same, a little bit different. And, you know, I think it's just being comfortable within ourselves. And I think that's the thing you probably get more with time. Yeah, that confidence to go. Oh, hey, you know, we like this album, and other people did. So, you know, we're confident with this one. And with this one, I think I was actually the maybe the most confident of, of every record. Okay, which is exciting because then it's yeah, I'm able to then just be excited and hyped up, and you're not like anxious or worried. I mean, we see a, there's a lot going on in the album, so it's hard to say like, oh, this is for me to highlight. That song definitely stands out. I think, uh, was it Suspire? Um, uh, also uh, stands out a lot. And then, um, I mean, that might be one of the heaviest tracks you guys ever recorded. I don't know. Um, yeah, uh, But Misery Court to the Anatomy of uh, Quiescence, I think it is. Um, yeah. For me, was like maybe a song that, that really jumps out at me. It's like, this is like a testament of what the band is. But then... Um, I think I read before that that song was kind of created based on, obviously, um, Misery Court number one. Um, how does that, how different is that process where you proactively go, because um, you've done this many times before, where you've done numbers one, two, three of a, of a, of a maybe a, a trilogy or, or what have you. Yeah. How is the, that writing process different when you set off with a mission of, I'm writing part two of this uh, versus yeah. writing a song like Anadonia, for example. Yeah, great question. So essentially how how I think about the albums is always in a in a total uh, a total um, combination of the music from start to finish. So okay. as soon as we start having multiple tracks in the works in my head, I'm trying to imagine possible track lists and possible track openers, finishes and stuff like that. I'm hearing a song and going, oh yeah, this would be a great way to start the record or this would be somewhere in this bit or... Uh, so uh, right in the middle of the writing process before we're anywhere near done, I'm already thinking about that. And then the other thing is that what comes up is that when, you know, my bandmates, because we have multiple songwriters in the band, 
uh, often I'm really inspired by what they write. So, you know, Misericord 1, um, you know, the guitarist, um, you know, drums, that like the main structure for that was predominantly written by um, Benji and Martino. And um, when, when we kind of finished that as an individual track, it was about seven and a half minutes or something like that. Mm -hmm. And it's then kind of me kind of sitting there at home, hearing that ending and going, well, like, is, is there anywhere else to take this? Like, is, is this done? Um, or is this something that we can then take off in a different direction? And I'm always thinking that at every point in every song. So every time we kind of hit a big long chord, it's like, is this the end or is there something else? Is there another twist right. in the direction of the song? And so for me, it was just that idea of, I was just sitting there on the piano, just playing along to the end of that track. And I came up with an idea um, and a chord progression that I really liked to jam over. It was just me uh, me singing originally. And then that changed to me playing the violin and then adding in a guitar solo and all that sort of stuff. Um, and then from there, the the kind of big long build up that takes place in Zero Chord 2 was actually something that, you know, we were jamming, which is very rare for us because you know, we live in three different countries. It was May 2019 and I had a few ideas for what could maybe come next. And we had a rare jam session. We were, uh, the guys were in Australia for an Australian tour. And we just sat there and, you know, I was just kind of pointing around the room like, hey, can you try this? Can you try this? And just in that organic way, we, came up with the basic build-up of that last kind of, you know, five minutes of Misericord. And we just did a lot, we just recorded the jam session. And we did, I just took it home and kind of pieced it together and went, yeah, these are the best bits. And then we kind mm -hmm. of built it from there. And so that was totally different because then part one was written just, you know, mostly Benji and Tino going back and forth, you know, via the internet. And then part two was kind of me at home on the piano mixed with us actually in the jam room. And then of course, bringing all the strings and all that sort of stuff just, you know, later from there. But it is just that difference in approach, which where you get that huge variety in sound, like those tracks are so different from each other. Yeah. And part of that is the difference in writing approach. Part of it is there's different primary writers, you know, two was, I guess I was a primary writer, you know, one was, you know, Ben Tiantino. But having said that, every member has their impact on each track you know the, yeah. the, the, the guitar solo in um in part two is just unbelievable i think it's one of benji's best yeah and uh, maybe that solo alone is for me like one of the highlights of the whole album like it was so good yeah and i think that's where no matter who's writing we try to kind of leave space to right. for the other members because we know that if you just write a whole track all by yourself it sounds like that member and when you so we kind of deliberately leave gaps here and there when we're writing for each other because we know that when it's it is that thing of you know when your powers combine like it is much yeah. more powerful and that really is the thing with Nabla Scaris music so you kind of leave this space you know bring in the different bass parts and the drums and the guitar and the heavy vocals clean with violin there's so many different layers yeah, yeah. it just makes such a big difference and um uh, but it's very much an organic thing, so it's not something we can't necessarily plan yeah, yeah, out. It's yeah. just hit hit a chord, is this done? Do we go somewhere else? And then we experiment and go from there. We have to come back to the to the video for Echoes because it's like it's such a beautiful video that came out. The, the the song itself is very intense. And it's a good, like you said, I think in the beginning, a good like overview of what we want to be as a band today. Um, yeah. uh, your violin is obviously playing a big role in that one too. Um, the song and the video deal with basically the earth having to deal with everything we throw at it, quite literally. Yeah. Um, which uh, I wanted to ask you about this because, uh, you know, moving on slightly from the music here, you know, I'm calling you from Canada, relatively progressive country. Uh, but if you look around the world more and more, not just, in, you know, to our southern friends, but more and more in the world, we're living in this tribalistic uh, world where you've got, you know, right against wrong, left versus right, black versus white, where there's parts in the world where people will almost like look at you or listen to you in a different way. Um, for being a band 
talking about a serious issue that is global warming. Um, mm -hmm. it, what's that like for you as an art? Do you feel like you, 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 you have a platform, therefore you need to use it for a right message? Um, is that something at all top of mind? What's that like for you? Yeah, so I think um, it's funny because like we we've never really been so so I'm a very political person, right. but we've never really been a political band, right? Um, and so it's like uh, getting that balance, um, and I think that obviously this was something where um you know this particular song you know inspired originally by some of the bushfires the huge right. epic fires that happened in 2019 there was just enormous amounts of um life lost especially with um with animal life and um just that you know broader sense of humans like just r ruining the planet and you know contributing i think the, the words like zen used when he was talking to me about this you know we're talking about contributing to our own demise in the long run. Mm -hmm. And um, I just think it's, for me, it's kind of the arrogance of of humans in, in the way we we treat the world and, and the planet and each other as well. And, you know, we you talked about getting split off into tribes. And the reality is, is that, you know, when people are really upset about a lot of stuff politically, often it's coming from a place of them being unhappy in their own lives. Um, and then fe them feeling like they're maybe not being validated, like they're not being listened to. And so often you have groups of people who both had the same experience of, I'm feeling unhappy with the way the world is, and I'm feeling like I'm not being listened to. And then some people take that experience and they go off over here and they call it right. And then they take the same experience and they go over here and they call it left because it's different solutions, right? Different right. solutions. But the experience, the problem is the same. The, the, the experience is that people are, are unhappy yeah. and people are unhappy with their condition in the world. And then because they have different ideas on how to solve that, all of a sudden they're fighting, which is ridiculous. And instead, if people actually took the time to connect and understand that, hey, we all as humans, we all suffer and we just want to be okay. We mm -hmm. want to be happy. We want to be free of this, this, um, these, these challenges. Like we have a lot more in common than we realize when you break it down to that. Yeah. But it yeah. it takes that deeper connection to be able to tap into that. And I think that's something that is really difficult in the world today because people are getting further apart with their opinions on what solutions we should have. Um, and, you know, sometimes it's really important to just re remember that a lot of those things are coming from the same, same place. Um, but it's hard. I mean, as an artist, I think that, yeah, like I said, I mean, if uh, growing up, like my dad was a politician, um, you know, a fairly left wing politician. And so, um you know that was kind of my upbringing and um it was you know always very much you know there's that notion like you know when i was a kid you would hear people say like oh you know you don't like talk about like politics or religion at the dinner table you know those sort of things and i'm like oh <laughs> we, that, well, that was on my dinner table <laughs> yeah exactly you know? um we talked about all sorts of different different things yeah, and yeah. i think it's important just to be aware of the way that we are in the world and aware of other people because you know, if we can at least just be start off from that position of of caring for each other or caring enough to note that it's important the condition of other people's beyond ourselves. Yeah. You know, you're not gonna reach everyone, not everyone's gonna come together. This is not one of those kumbaya things, that's not how the world works. But the reality is is that there is a lot more togetherness that could happen just by taking the time to make that effort. And a lot of people are just closed off to that, which is uh, frustrating. <laughs> With the release of EXO on March 24th and then all the live shows that you uh, you guys are going to uh, plan for, um, uh, you know, you guys will start bringing people together um, and uh, hopefully, you know, 
be be part of the solution of bringing people together all over the world, which will be uh, which will be great. Um, Tim, I want to thank you so much. Um, I, I wish I could ask you 20 more questions and go for a couple of more hours, but I want to be very respectful of your time. Um, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. I'm extremely excited for your fans to discover the music because uh, I do think it is your best album, and I don't say that to every person that I interview. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's uh, it's exciting times, and I uh, hope to see you guys take this uh, work of art on the road real soon. Yeah, thank you so much. It's just going to quick note on that. It's, I, I keep telling people, like everyone that I talk to, oh, this is our best record. And everyone always has this, oh, every band says the new record is their best. I was like, no, 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 like really. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm excited just for, you know, not everyone, you know, like everyone has different favorites with albums, but um, of course. it's definitely the one I'm, I think, most proud of and feels closest to how um, the vision we have of the band. and. It's going to be so exciting to get back on the road because there are a lot of people all around the world, you know, that we've been, um, uh, that we know very well, you know, that we, we, we meet and we hang out with and that we have these deep connections with at our concerts. And um, it'll just be great to get back to making those connections again and, um, and making new ones and, um, and just exploring that around the world once more will be uh, an amazing thing. So, yeah, thanks for having me and um, for the time. watching this video click right here to see more content like it and subscribe to the channel